Welcome to Coffee with Kyle number 21. I'm Kyle Ridgway. Good evening. I wanted to start with a quick question. Can you stop short? I was, uh, I stumbled upon this question when I stumbled upon um, some older blog posts by a friend and colleague of mine, Eric Kruger. And he wrote a blog post back in 2014 entitled, Can You Stop Short? And I want to read the first couple of paragraphs from that blog post, which I think is a fascinating and fantastic read, and I will link to it. I want to start with a simple question. As a therapist, are you prepared to stop min at mid-intervention to listen to the patient? If not, I don't think you're ready to treat pain seriously. That's a bit blunt, you say. Right? Well, I think it, this is important. The question is how I got to that point of making this judgment. Well, it starts with something I have noticed in clinicians throughout the years, which is their disdain for the communicative, communicative moments in therapy, especially sessions where the patient is doing most of the talking. After such sessions, the therapist returns to the confines of the office exacerbated, exasperated rather. The patient just won't stop talking about all their problems. It is my opinion that the hallmark of exemplary clinical reasoning of pain is the therapist's ability to react, to react instantaneously to a perceived need by the patient to express themselves and to listen attentively. Let's start with the fact that we as physical therapists are not groomed with skills of communication. Some of us who are attracted to the profession are good communicators, especially those that stick around for a while. Some of us might be highly relatable within the niches of clientele we have crafted for ourselves. However, communication skills are not requisite and definitely not universal, even if you are relatable. Our schooling reflects doing unto others. Rarely it considers listening to others. It is fixated on creating patient-centered goals, but leaves emotions, beliefs, and cognitions conspicuously out of the picture. So after rereading that, um, you know, I think Eric here in his post is talking mostly about treating individuals who have painful complaints of various varieties, but I think really we can expand the concept to any clinical setting, um, to any profession who works with patients in vulnerable populations, and reflect on this concept of can you stop mid-intervention or mid-assessment um, or mid-evaluation to listen to the patient? And first of all, I think this is a very tough skill because what it involves is you have to be metacognitive enough that you're not just thinking about what you need to do and what you're assessing and the information you're collecting, but you actually have to take a step back and now you have to actually be dynamically assessing what the patient is telling you, their nonverbal cues, and the entirety of the environment. This takes a real commitment to being present and being intensely focused on not just what you're doing, not just what you're thinking and your hypotheses, but also using the patient's demeanor and words as part of that dynamic assessment and their tone of voice and, and times when they may be reserved because they want to say something or times that they've diverted from a topic or a, or a sentence or a concept that you think that they actually want to talk about. So I'm not and do not want to undersell how hard this interpersonal and clinical skill may be. But I think if we talk about this concept, we talk about this concept of, of stopping something because you sense that the patient would like to express something, or even that the conversation or interaction should go a different direction, um, is an immediate opportunity to peek into the patient's perspective. Uh, and this could include their understanding, their fears, their expectations, their desires, even their frustrations. And if we look at this from a very, what I'll call superficial analysis, we could look at this and say, absolutely, this is a great way to check the patient's understanding of their uh, disease process or problem and, and their understanding of what the proper treatment plan is. And this is also a great way to increase buy-in. This is a great way to increase adherence to our recommendations and a great way to improve outcomes. And I'm saying that in a little bit of a sarcastic voice um, because I think that's the superficial level analysis. And it's not bad. I don't think it's bad or wrong. Those are all great things. Those are our fantastic things. And if we do that 
and we improve outcomes and and that's the reason that we do it or that's how we conceptualize doing it, that's still fine. We've done it. We've stopped short. We've given the patient the space, the opportunity, and the attention to express what they may be needing, desiring, or wanting to express, and that is important. But we also learn not just maybe what info may benefit a patient or what information they have. We may also learn a little something about how to deliver that information validate the patient's experiences and engage them as an individual, as a human being, in the process of clinical care. Now, admittedly, this may be very uncomfortable because we may change the course of the conversation, we may change the course of treatment, or we may change the course of the care plan momentarily or even permanently as a result of taking a pause at this stop sign in the road. But, as some may have said, the only way to sail is with the wind, after all. And we have to remember that in all clinical settings, we should be using the patient as our guide of how to surf and navigate this terrain. Not to dictate, but to guide. And this should be a process that we go along together. Like I said, I, admittedly, We've all had these moments that we recognize them in the moment and because of our own discomfort or our own lack uh, of ability or time or focus, which has for sure happened to me, uh, happens regularly I would admit, we haven't been able to stop short or give the patient enough time or the right time or the right uh, facilitation or cues to be able to uh, talk in this way or, or to change the, the direction of the conversation or the direction of the intervention. Um, and I think that's good, that's okay, that it can be uncomfortable and disconcerting. Uh, this is an opportunity to think about, can we have graded exposure to this space and interaction? Um, I wanna go back to the blog post. There is potential for frust frustration at the point when the patient may be wishing to express the most important aspects of themselves or their pain but our own discomfort with the situation causes us to shut it down, divert, or distract. Oh, the patient seems uncomfortable and distressed. Well, I must cheer the patient up so that we can keep going. Or, that is just a psychological problem, not in my wheelhouse, are both potential common excuses of the treating therapist. The expression of pain is both the verbal and nonverbal communication of pain to another person. It is a type of pain behavior that it carries emotional valence and demands the attention of the listener. If we take a person's emotions, beliefs, and thoughts as part of that expression, and we choose to ignore it or explain it away, there is a problem. We may be potentially thwarting the patient's expression and thus frustrating the natural sequence and process of pain, pain resolution. Unfortunately, a patient's complaint is not going to come in a neat little package, a numerical rating, or a common adjective. Understanding it as such might cause the patient to feel that their expression fell on deaf ears. The expression of distress and pain is messy and sometimes tied up with other aspects of the person's being. The more comfortable we are with ourselves and the patient, the better listeners we can become. I th and I th again, I think I, I'd like to expand this um, concept of things much greater than pain and in my, my own setting in the acute care hospital specifically um, the intensive care unit, I, I've noticed many, many times where um, you can kind of tell a patient is, is distressed or, or struggling with something either physically, symptom-wise, psychologically, um, existentially. I mean, when patients are critically sick and facing the possibility of imminent, near, or uh, have come close to death, that this can cause people to really start to question a lot about themselves and their lives. And um, you know, the same is true of any other setting. It doesn't have to be pain. Um, you know, I used the example of the 17-year-old patient who uh, tears her ACL, and that was her kind of formative identity. Uh, the patient who has had a stroke, uh, the patient who has had, a, you know, an orthopedic trauma, the patient who has had a surgery. I, I don't think that this concept is um, insular to one setting or one type of patient population. And again, I don't think it's applicable only to one profession. Why, why I think it is so important is that it allows us 
to really understand and really dig down deep into really the patients, what I would say is their kind of conceptual worldview of what is going on. And the more that we know about that, especially in the own patients, in the patient's own words, and especially times that patients are offering up this inner information either indirectly because of something we said or just because they feel comfortable in the moment doing it or really have a kind of a, a desire or a almost a, a, a need that they must say it, I think it's important that we, we do take the time to pause and to stop because we are going to potentially find out something that no one else who's working with this patient may know. And it may be vital pieces of information that really clue you into what makes this patient tick, what's gonna, um, what's really gonna give them the outcome they want, or what is the outcome that they want, or what are they willing to endure, what um, really motivates them. It doesn't really matter at what level we're trying to engage with the patient here. This is an important thing. Because I think even if everything we do or you, or you do after this, and, and all the recommendations you make are unchanged, even if the outcome in the course is unaffected, the pause and the stroll down a potentially different path will change the experience of the patient, potentially change their story, and will keep us exploring the conversational space that we have with our patients. And I think that's uh, an important thing that we can do. So I will leave you with that this evening. It was good to see you. Have a great night.